Hello, my name is Johannes Drakenberg and welcome to my studio here in Stockholm, Sweden. Today we're going to be doing a review of the Allen & Heath Zone K2 MIDI controller. Basically, I'm doing a review because when I was about to buy it, I didn't find anyone that was pretty in-depth. So I'm going to make this review uh, after having them for about one month and uh, for using them 3 gigs out in clubs. And to share my knowledge and uh, experiences with these MIDI controllers. This review is going to be quite long, so I um, divided it up in different sections. Uh, I'll put the time codes in below in the description so you can click through to find out more about the specific area you want to find out about. So um, I hope you enjoyed this. Please share, rate this video, and um, also subscribe, and you'll get more tutorials and reviews coming up. All right, let's start. So let's cover the basics. The Xon K2 MIDI controller from Allen & Heath is a all-in-one solution for professional and amateur DJs. It features a 4-channel 48kHz built-in sound card. You have the ability to link two of these K2s together in order to function on just one USB port. You have a total of 52 MIDI controllers around the controller, which with the latching layers function can access up to 171 different MIDI commands. It comes with a case included in the price and it's perfect for MIDI mappers and anyone who like to build their own controllers. I find it to be very very good. Connectivity wise we have a lot a lot of features going on. We have the master output in the rear, we have the two X-Link connectors in and out and we have the USB and in the front we have the headphone connector. The X-Link connectors are great for connecting two of these units together just using one USB port. Uh, these can also be connected to any sort of Allen & Heath X-Link capable unit, such as the DB4 or the DB2. The audio card connects with RCA cables on the rear for the master, and a normal headphone connector, mini jack or whatever you want to call it, on the front for the headphones. The USB on the rear can power up to two Xone K2 units using the X-Link function and it's a standard B-type connector. If we are to go to some pros and cons with the connectivity, I think it's great to have such many connections on such a small controller. You have the audio, X-Link, USB and for the headphones. Uh, as for cons, I think the headphone connector with the mini jack is a little bit fragile towards corded uh, headphone cables such as these you can find on the TMA ones and other headphones. Uh, what I did, I switched my cable to a lighter one uh, in order to not break the connector itself. Otherwise, it's a lot of good connectors on this unit. The Xone K2 unit features a 48 kilohertz four-channel sound card with great quality. There are two connect connectors in the rear for the master output and two connectors in the front for the headphones. The master output is a lot stronger than the headphone connector for obvious reasons. You would not be able to match the output of a CDJ or a turntable with this connector however you are with the master output. This setup is optimal for internal mixing mode and if you want to you can actually link, link these two in your Mac OS X to have a full of eight outputs for your mixer if you want to do that. The K2 features 52 different MIDI controllers. It features 30 LED buttons with 18 in the bottom, 12 at the top. It features 6 encoders with 4 of them having LED feed feedback as well as 2 in the bottom. It features 12 seamless knobs without the click and it features 2 system LED buttons at the very bottom. The latching layer functionality makes the controller being able to have 171 different MIDI commands over three different layers. There are three layers. There's red, amber, and green. This is great for people who does not want to use modifiers in Tractor or people with less experience with using modifiers. There are five different setups for the latching layers functionality. To switch between the five you simply unplug the connector, hold in the power on setup button, plug the USB cable inside, it will flash three times, you use the encoder, go to latching layers, press the button, and here you go. 
So the first option is completely off, which means no controls will be under the latching layers functionality. The second option is only for the switch matrix down here, which means these control will be not be affected by the latching layers, whilst this, these will be. The third option means all the switches on top plus the encoders will be affected by the latching layers. The fourth option means the encoders, the switches here, and the switch matrix at the bottom will be affected by the latching layers. And last but not least, every single control except the layer button itself will be affected by the latching layers. To save your setup, simply select the, feed, the setup you want and then push the power on setup button, exit setup, and you have it saved. When using latching layers, there's a built-in soft takeover inside the controller, which means that if you're switching layers and the value you currently is using in the layer will not be affected until you actually reach the value itself. So let's say this is the value we're going to, this is the, where the fader was. This value will not be affected until we reach the same point. point. Then it's going to be affected, which is really, really good for not having huge jumps in your mixing. Let's look at some, some pros and some cons. This is great for inexperienced MIDI mappers or simple mapping. It has a true bypass for all the other commands. It's uh, easy to have the feedback with the different colors. And it's really nice to change the different setups. The cons though, I think it's really bad that you can't access different MIDI out messages, which means you can't access a green light inside the red layer and so on. Also, I would be really, really happy to uh, being able to alter these different setups myself. Currently, I use the uh, all-off latching layers because then I have full control using modifiers and tractor. Let's look at some raw MIDI mapping capabilities. Uh, you have a total of 52 different commands. You have a total of 171 in commands of the controller. And for the outs, you have 129 different outs over 40 different LED monitors. With the manual that comes along, you'll be able to find every single color for every single LED, which is really nice if you're mapping it all manually. With the latching layers activated, only colors that are within the selected layer can be used. The other ones will not work. Uh, in Tractor, this is something called blend mode, which does not work with this controller. Simply what happens is that once you reach 50% of the value of the control you're having the blend mode activated on, the LED will turn on. In other controllers, it will gradually fade until it reaches the full value. It has a soft, built-in soft takeover function when using latching layers, which is great if you... Uh, have a lot of, have the faders assigned to a lot of different functions and you don't want this jump when you switch between the layers and you have the ability to change the MIDI channel inside the controller itself between 1 and 16 this is actually a must if you're using the two K2s on the same USB port otherwise they will do the same thing so let's look at some pros and cons regarding the raw MIDI capabilities. The pros are that you have three different colors for maximum feedback. You have the red color, the green color, and the orange color. You have a lot of LEDs, 40s in to 40 different LED outputs in total with 129 different colors. Lots of different controls. You, as you see, you have the encoders with push functionality, you have the knobs, you have the switch switches below the knobs, you have four faders, the switch matrix, and two encoders in the bottom. This is really, really good. And it has a soft takeover built in when using latching layers. Looking at the cons, there's no blend mode. Uh, at least I haven't been able to get it to function properly. There's no real shift button, as they, they say this button here is supposed to be a shift button, but it's not. Uh, I actually mapped it myself. That's the, the only way to work, have it work. And the latching layers does disable the functionality to use the green LEDs inside the red layer and so on, which I find really bad. The K2 comes with a case included in the price, which is really, really a really nice feature. This case doubles as a stand and it's really good for protecting the unit itself. Let's go for some pros and cons with these cases. Let's go for the pros. The K2 comes with a case, as mentioned, 
opens up really nicely, take the lid off, there you go. It functions as a stand which will elevate the unit to the same height of any standard uh, mixer or CD player. The case itself is very very durable, very, very well designed, has uh, really thick EVA shock walls that will protect the uh, units from you going into World War 3 with your MIDI controller. As for the cons, I think the case is actually worthless, to be honest. Uh, it's just way too big with these EVA shock walls, makes the case. You can't really pack it into most DJ bags. And the other thing I found out is, when you reach this point with a zip lock, uh, it can get really hard, it's really hard to open the case itself. It gets stuck because there's like a multi zip lock thingy going on in there as you can see here which is really bad as well but mainly the case is way too big I think they should make they should have made it smaller like the X1 case I don't really use the cases to be honest so let's have a little bit look of the X1 from Native Instruments versus the Allen Heath K2 from Allen Heath uh, first off obviously the size is quite different, the K2 being bigger than the X1 and thicker as well, if you can see there. Uh, however though, I think that the size doesn't really matter. This one actually measures the same height as the DJ mixer, while as the X1 does not, it's a little bit smaller. With the K2 unit being bigger than the X1 itself, of course the case is going to be a lot bigger. Um, I think the X1 case, the, the old school one actually, is uh, a lot better because there's pretty much no foam around the unit itself, which means that the case itself is going to be really small, while as the uh, K2 case is really thick. It does, however, pack these slopes in the bottom of the unit for uh, having the controller sit really stable on the table. Um, they are about equally as thick. But yeah, as you can see, the K2 case is a lot bigger. You, when you really hold these two in the same hand, you'll feel the difference. The overall feel uh, of the two units, I think, we'll start with the X1. I think the buttons are really nice, they're really fast, they're really responsive. Uh, they light up with a nice blue color. The encoders clicks are really accurate, so is the uh, push on the encoders. The knobs on the X1 are really nice, they have a little bit of resistance to them, and they have the click in the middle. Um, I think the X1 is really sturdy, uh, feels really nice and robust, I guess. I don't know what you're saying, but you know. Um, it's a really good unit. I used this for two years and really, really happy with it. It's been always been there for me, never failed me once. As for the K2, uh, I think the buttons, they f it feels like the click has some sort of a slope to it, which means from actually clicking it till you hit the bottom, it the resistance gradually fades, um, which it feels like they're a little bit slower. Of course, they're the same speed as the X1s, but the X1s just feel more like a trigger type than these. These feel like a, you're hitting a ball or something. Um, same thing with the encoder, uh, the encoder push, it feels like it's slowly fading before it hits the stop, which it doesn't add to the overall feeling. The clicks on the K2 are smaller than the X1. Uh, the faders, which the X1 doesn't have of course, it, they're really nice, I like them, feel really good. The knobs have a lot more resistance than the X1. However though, the main thing, the main difference here is that the K2 knobs does not have the click in the middle at 12 o'clock, which indicates when you're in the middle of position. For some people that can be a really big hassle. For me in the beginning, it was a big hassle. I guess I've got, gotten used to it by now, but yeah, just so you know. Worth mentioning is that the K2 does feel really sturdy as well. It feels like a really well-made unit. Uh, I don't think there is. A, I think this is a tie when it comes to quality feel of the the overall quality feel of the unit. As for the hardware controls, obviously the uh, K2 has a lot more controls than the X1. As you can see, they both have the 16 button matrix down here, uh, where the uh, X1 has the 
encoders, you have the faders on the K2, you have some buttons here as well, some system buttons. You have four rotaries up top where you have 12 rotaries on the K2, you have the four encoders at the top of the K2, you also have the 12 buttons near the rotaries which is really nice. Uh, the K2 outranks the X1 when it comes to hardware controls. I think the layout of the K2 is a lot better than the X1. For me, being a media mapper myself, it allows me to create the layout I want to use. The X1 has a great layout for the internal mappings that come along. Sadly though, I don't like all the things being printed out and you know that someone else thought for me. That's why I like the K2 a lot better because it allows me to create whatever I want to create. There's no printed labels except for some letters down here, that's all. The price for these two, I don't know exactly what the price is in your local store, but seeing that this one has a built-in sound card, it comes with a case, uh, it outranks the X1 by miles, because with this one you would need to buy the case separately and you would need to buy a sound card to be able to DJ, whilst with this one, when you buy it, you get everything you need to perform right out of the box, which is a really nice feature. The plug and play for both of these units, they both plug and play right off. This one though you have to install some drivers. Uh, this one the audio card where it strikes out. You obviously have to install the mini maps for both of them. The mappings that come along with the K2 and the X1 is... I haven't really tried out the K2 because I bought these with the idea of that I wanted to remap them myself completely from scratch. Uh, with the X1, the mappings that come along are great, even though I modified them too, but um, it's really well thought out. Uh, you can buy one of these and you'll be able to do a lot of crazy things with this small unit and with lack of all these buttons. I do not think that the mappings that come along with the K2 are as well planned out as X1, but then the thing is, the X1 is for the DJ who wants to plug and play and don't really think about MIDI mapping at all. The K2, I think, was designed for people who really want to make their own environment and how they perform. Uh, so it's kind of a draw there because you can't really compare them. As for the mapping abilities between the two, uh, the X1 has, this, has a great mapping from scratch. Uh, it does allow the blend feature. So let's have a little look at the blend feature I was talking about before. I've mapped the dry wet of the effects one on to this fader, and I've out mapped two out messages, one to this LED right here and one to this LED. So as I increase the value, you see the K2 turns on instantly, whilst the X1 fades gradually. Uh, this might not affect everyone, but it affects me who wants to do beautiful visualized mappings with a lot of fading out messages. So, as you can see, once again, the K2 just turns on and off, while the X1 fades. I wanted to talk a little bit about why I got the K2 in the first place. Uh, the first and foremost reason why I got the K2s was because I've had the X1 for a very long time, two years, and uh, I wanted to uh, do something new. I like to media map a lot, which uh, some people already might know. Um, and these two were really good because they were small and uh, they had a lot of um, functionality to them. So, first off, I wanted to create something new. Uh, secondly, the built-in sound card is really nice because I really don't have a problem with connecting the audio A to the mixer with all the four channels. But the problem is that people who were playing before or after me got really stressed out by me unplugging every CDJ and turntable and you know, unplugging cables all the time. I never made a mistake, but people who didn't know me got really uh, stressed out about that. And the last thing you want when you're performing in a club is a stressy environment before or after you're entering the booth. It's also not good to be enemies with other DJs that, you know, think that you're really stressed out. So the built-in sound card allows me to just connect one cable to the mixer and that's it. No stress, no nothing. Everyone is calm and happy. It allows me to mix internally in Tractor, which can be both a drawback and an advantage. I prefer it because then I have the same setup wherever I go in the world. I have the I know exactly what I'm working with, which is a really nice fe feature actually. If if you can't always request uh, whatever mixer you want on the technical writer, it's 
always good to know that you you know what you're working with basically um, and you know it's also really nice that you can X-link these two units uh, using only one USB port for two of these it's really nice because that allows me to connect maybe a sound card if I would ever do that again or another MIDI controller um, allowing because I don't really want to use USB hubs at all I kind of hate them I know I have a hub here in the back but that's for the studio on the road I would never want to use a powered USB hub so yeah that's a great feature too so I want to talk a little bit about going uh, from a normal DJM or zone mixer to mixing internally into the K2 unit uh, the first thing the first and most important thing is that the EQ knobs on a normal DJ mixer is far more apart than the K2 as you can see I can fit one finger in here on a normal mixer I can fit two fingers in between um, th it's nice to have a lot of space on a DJ mixer uh, also these EQ knobs has a click in the middle which is really nice to know when you're in the middle not looking at the mixer the K2 does not um, and it's really cramped if you wanna reach the mid mids here you have to watch out not to be too aggressive because then you'll be turning the other knobs as the, at the same time. However though, one advantage with the, having the tight knobs is that you can alter two knobs at the same time with just one hand. So I lower the bass and raise the bass here with just one hand. That is nice. Secondly, I think the faders on a normal DJ mixer is far better, mainly because of the caps they have on, the battle caps compared to the studio design caps on the K2 um, you can't really cut as quick on the K2 it doesn't feel as accurate you can really hear the click on the mixer K2 is different also if you want to mute three channels for just one beat for example it's really simple you grab the whole mixer and do that with the K2 though it's a little bit harder because there's a lot more motion to the MIDI controller itself as you can see it moves a lot and grabbing them like this is not very easy at all times so the faders are definitely a lot better uh, I wish these had a uh, the battle caps on for sure when it comes to pre-listening I I'm really used to having mixed on the DJM series for I don't know over seven years maybe I'm really used to this master on and off cue function um, on the K K2 or in tractor really um, you don't have the ability to cue the master the only thing you have is like on the Xone units is you can turn a dial uh, which is all the way to the left is only the cues so you'll only hear the cues and uh, to the right you only hear the master and then you mix in between these two that's how Tractor's cue function works uh, and you all know how the DJM 800 works also I don't know, the, f the overall feeling of mixing on a real mixer is a lot better than mixing on the K2. However though, if you aren't the most established DJ there is and you can't request the same mixer every gig you're going to, knowing your gear really really well with the K2 uh, is a really good feature. Um, I mean, I obviously know how the 92 and the 800 everything works, but Obviously I mix a lot better on the 800 than I do on the 92 because I've spent a lot more time with this mixer. But only have, having the same unit wherever I go allows me to really feel at home when I'm in the booth. And that, that's really important when you're going abroad because you are not used to the club and you want to be, you want to feel secure with your setup. So it's really nice to have this. You lose some feeling going from the mixer to the K2 but you gain a lot of having the same setup being used to it so it's a give and take it's I guess you have to sacrifice a little bit going to this one another thing with the uh, going from a mixer to the X zone K2 is that you don't have the LED feedback for each channel unless you, you I mean of course you can modify an LED to uh, switch between green orange and red obviously obviously though as it doesn't have the blend feature you can't make it nice and transparent and you would obviously have to sacrifice one button for LED feedback which you kinda don't wanna do if you you wanna use all these buttons for your mixing so let's do a final overall review of the K2 uh, starting with the pros 
The uh, built-in sound card requires only one cable and one channel to the DJ mixer in the club, which is a really, really nice feature if you are touring a lot and playing in lineups where there's DJs after you and before you. Uh, it's really nice to just have in one cable to connect. Uh, if you're using the internal mixing mode with this unit, it's really nice to have the same setup wherever you go. You are, you're really familiar with the tools you're using, which can be a very, very good feature. I love that feature myself. It has really good LED feedback functionality, uh, having three different colors for every LED uh, monitor there are, is. It's green, red, and orange. Uh, there's lots of different controls. Um, there's six encoders, 12 knobs. 30 different LEDs, LED buttons, it's really nice and you have the faders of course in the middle. Um, the latching layers capability allows for easy MIDI mapping if you are inexperienced with uh, mapping yourself and also allows for easy feedback between the layer you are. It has a four channel layout, um, if you're using four decks this is pretty much Optus, uh, uh, it's super good for it, I don't know, my English is failing me slowly here. Um, yeah, four channel layout is really really nice. Um, there's no preset commands printed onto the unit as the X1 has. There's it doesn't say play here or Q here or loop in. You know, it's completely clear on the design, which is really nice because you want to build your if you're building your own design, you know which button does what, and you don't want things to be printed on there. Um, it has a great build quality, feels really sturdy and I think that these babies are going to last for a long time and a lot of traveling uh, they're going to be able to s sustain really well. Uh, you have the ability to host two K2 units on just one USB port allowing for a second MIDI device if you're using a MacBook which can be really nice if you don't want to use a USB hub which I hate personally. Um, and all of course the different commands different controls available, it's really nice, it's really versatile, you can do a lot of things with these units. Uh, it comes with a case that doubles as a stand, it comes included in the price, which is a really nice feature. Going over to the cons of the K2, uh, the first thing is that the MIDI messages going out, which is the LEDs, they can't be blended, and I showed you earlier on this video, it basically means that if you increase a value, um, the LED would fade gradually till its full value, but on the K2 it switches on or off, which I think is really bad. I kind of would have really wanted to have that on the K2 for the for nicer visual feedbacks, but it's, not, it's a minor thing maybe. Um, the headphone socket on the front is a small jack, which means that if you're using a uh, heavier cable, uh, cork corkscrew cable such as these, um, it feels as if the uh, mini jack can break really easily. Uh, so what I did, I switched to an easier cable in order not to break it. Uh, the fader caps are studio designed, which some people find to be really nice. I kind of don't like that. I like the battle faders, which you can find on the normal DJM or Zone mixers. Uh, these are really hard to, you know, it's easier to grab the battle caps than the studio caps. But it's, uh, I guess for the effect, it's a nice uh, design to have. There's no middle click on the pots at all, so it's just seamlessly from zero to full. Uh, and if you're using this as an equalizer, it can get some time to get used to it. Uh, I'm just now, after three gigs, getting um, used to that. Uh, there's no midpoint, but that's just, that's just so you know. Um, <clears throat> it's a little bit cramped compared to a normal mixer. The EQs are really, really close to each other which can be a problem if you're turning the mids really aggressively um, and you you know you spread your hands out you can you'll alter all the EQs at the same time which you don't want to do uh, if you can put a pros in one of the, in the cons the cons section um, it's nice because you can alter two EQ pots at the same time if you want to do that um, the uh, encoder clicks and the button clicks feels a little bit slow uh, compared to the X1 which is really accurate and fast. It feels like there's a slope when you push it so it's gradually gradually fading towards a stop. Um, 
I would like them to be a little more accurate, but however though, the speed of the MIDI message is just as fast as the X1, it's just the overall feel of the click. Um, the Ethernet cable that comes along with the unit is really, really short. Uh, you can basically only put them next to each other. If you want to spread them out across the booth like I do, uh, you need the longer cable. Uh, I used the DJM2000 or CDA2000 Ethernet cable to connect my K2s together. Um, that's a minor thing. Uh, another thing with the Ethernet cable that came along is that it actually died after a day. Uh, of unpacking it and I didn't I haven't been taking it out of my studio or anything it just died out of nowhere and uh, I had to switch cable so that's a uh, kind of a minus I guess uh, the rubber pads in the bottom are actually not rubber pads they're just hard plastic which they if you're putting it on a table they can slip fairly easily to compared to a rubber pair of rubber feet um, it is a bit too big for normal DJ bags such as the ultimate DJ um, sling bags. I find it, I had to angle them uh, in order to get them in at all, which doesn't allow for an optimal packing in the case. You would obviously, like the X1, just put it level, level it down to the floor and then put things on top so everything sits really nice and tight. Um, which I find this to be a little bad because when you're flying and they're you know not handling the goods very good, since you're having these angled inside the bag, the things in the bottom will jump around unless you pack it really well. It's which is not a really nice feature. They're a little bit too big for the standard bags. However, of course, if you have a normal cabin luggage bag, you'll get it in, and it will they will sit tight with the case itself. Uh, going over to the case, the case is too big. It's just huge. Uh, I hate these cases actually. They're really, they, def you know, they, they keep the unit intact, of course, even through war, I guess. Uh, but they're just way too big to uh, actually bring out your studio. That's what I, th that's what I think, at least. It's, I wish Ultimate DJ Gear would create a new sort of case for the K2s, like they did with the X1. That would be a little bit smaller and, um, wouldn't have the same uh, weight and you know the shock walls to them. I really don't like that feature at all. Last but not least, I would give this controller a four out of five because it's a super super good controller for professional artists, also hobbyists, anyone basically who mixes with Tractor. It's great because it has the only needs one cable for the audio. Uh, you can link them together. It has a lot of different controls in there. It's also great for beginners, actually people who have never been DJing before, buying one of these controllers, it's all you need. Uh, you have the mixer comp compartment, you have the EQ compartment, only one sound card, it's really good. I don't know if I should say that or if I should say, go with vinyl instead, or something stupid like that. But you get the idea. It's, it's a really nice unit and I'm really, really, really satisfied with them. Um, only haven't done... I've had them for one month and I've done three gigs with them. Uh, really, really satisfied. They're, every gig gets more and more fun and with the mappings I created myself, it's, they work really nice. So that was my review of the Xone K2 unit. Alright, so that was my review of the Allen Heath Xone K2 MIDI controller. I hope you learned a lot of new things about this controller. Um, and uh, I would really appreciate it if you would uh, share this video, rate it, and also subscribe to my channel. Uh, I will make more reviews and tutorials regarding DJing, production, and whatever else I may find interesting to make a tutorial on. My name is Johannes Drakenberg, and have a nice day. Cheers.